Um, okay. Akisha is here, and I'm going to let her tell you a little about your, herself. And welcome, Akisha. We're, we're so glad to have you here. If um, my students don't see you, tonight, thank you for having. If my if my students don't see you tonight, they will catch the recording afterwards, and they'll they'll write some reflections about what they learned from you. And um, as I mentioned before, we're we're really focused on staff development and, and picking up any tips or tricks or ideas. Um, we've talked to people like. And the last person we talked to was Gary Steger. I don't know if you follow him on Twitter. He was at this conference in India with me, who was very provocative. We've talked to uh, Mike Muir from Maine. We've talked to Mike Lawrence, who used to work for Q. Um, Sarah from Alabama, as I mentioned before. And so, uh, you know, it's been, everybody's offered something unique, and it's been kind of fun because it's not been structured. It's not been, like, set up to be... It, but everything has made sense and been timely for our group, I think, it's kind of serendipitous. So without further ado, um, oh, by the way, Akisha knows me because uh, we're Facebook friends and we're always sharing stuff, but she, she was part of my Global Ed Conference early on, and, and I'll let her tell you her formal background. So without further ado, welcome, Akisha. We're so glad to have you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is because I'm not very, not, not, not a great public speaker. I thought this would be a chance to um, help with that and also to learn more about what you all are doing. Um, I graduated from Michigan in 2013, and my background is in curriculum teaching and educational policy. But before that, I spent about uh, between my run education spans about over 20 years. I'm, I'm an instructional designer at heart. Um, I've had a lot of different backgrounds, um, experiences through K through 12 and higher ed, but um, I think instructional design is what I, and educational technology is what I enjoy doing most. Um, the, what I want to talk to you about today focuses on um, the idea of TPAC, which is technological pedagogical content knowledge. Um, over um, from 2014 through 2016, I worked with um, Dr. Punya Mishra, who is um, one of the founders of TPAC, in an urban teaching program that was based in Chicago with Chicago public school teachers. And basically, it aimed at reaching out to um, exemplar. Um, teachers in the Chicago public school systems and helping them um, hone their technology skills and leadership skills. And he, with his permission, I'm sharing um, one of the presentations that we delivered in the um, in the course of ground. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see it. And I think you see it. Do you see a big sign saying got TPAC right now? Uh, I see. Yes, I do. Okay. I didn't. It's so uh, Punya was supposed to be at a conference I was at in Ireland, but I think he's his dad died. Yeah, his, his, his father passed away earlier this month. Yeah, yeah, that's why he wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So too bad. I, he's a very fascinating guy. He is. It was. It was a great honor working with. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, I'm really glad to consider him a mentor. And it, it was a good experience. And that's why um, I wanted to share this with, with you all. Um, so let's see. So basically, that's the title of this presentation. And um, the argument is that technology when, when people debate about technology and especially how it impacts society, you can either argue that it really changes, that it changes nothing because we were always doing certain things. It's just that uh, maybe the technology that we have makes it different. I mean, um, excuse me, the top technology we have may make it more efficient, but we're still able to do the things that we did before without the te technology or that it changes everything. It introduces a new dimension to how we um, view the world. So um, if we look at 21st century learning, um, and this was adapted from this framework, you're welcome to um, go look at it in more detail. There are three core 
um, fonts of knowledge that um, it explores. And that's what, what do we have to know and what do we value as well as um, how, how do we go about acting on that. Um, and, but what this, what we're going to focus in on right now is how do we actually learn with technology? And so let me see if I can move this screen over here. And you probably saw this before a long time ago. I'm supposed to start with these operation programs first. This major book in shape. Let's do something a little more fun. How about combat training? Jiu-jitsu. I'm going to learn jiu-jitsu. So a lot of times when we're introduced to a new technology or we're told that a new technology is going to be the wave of the future, sometimes we think that this is how the technology is going to transform us. Let me go back to the presentation. What do you think of this tea pack stuff? Sorry. But in reality, it doesn't occur as quickly as a lot of the new technologies as a lot of the new technologies purport to help us just get instantaneous knowledge um, we usually go through Bloom's technology we start off with the knowledge level and work our way up to synthesis and evaluation where we can actually create and evaluate our experiences so education and technology as I mentioned um, Punya Mishra is one of the two founders of the TPAC model and they developed it from a lot of different ideas but primarily uh, such as uh, fluency and technology um, but primarily it is it's based off of um, Dr. Lee Shulman's work which is um, he's the founder of the pedagogical content knowledge framework and we'll talk about that right now so when we think about content um, you have um, several different areas of content um, wait a minute, I'm sorry. You have several um, different areas of content. Um, whatever the discipline, each has changed by the evolution of technology throughout the last seven, several hundreds of years. So for example, history is constantly changing because of the increasing availability of source materials and archiving on the web. And also if we look at how virtual reality can actually allow us to drop ourselves into certain historical scenarios that have been cre created so we can experience them. Or science and engineering advances in computing have changed how we do science, uh, how we operate in science and, and in those disciplines. So um, move towards, they allow us to move towards simulations and modeling of phenomena that are central means for investigating different theories and designs. And so, um, it actually changes the, um, the context in which we teach. And so the importance of disciplinary knowledge is it actually, it teaches us to see the purposes of those disciplines, the knowledge within those dis disciplines, the methods in which we, uh, the methods we use within those dis disciplines and the forms in which they take. Um, when it comes to um, pedagogy, um, excuse me, we think about the strategies that we're using and how do those change? 
um, they're constantly changing as well. Consider, for example, how we teach online, how, how it has impacted how we teach a discipline in general. I can tell you, I taught online for about 10 years, and then I was asked to teach in a classroom, and I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> This is a big difference between teaching online and teaching face to face. So what I ended up doing to get back comfortable with teaching face to face is going to Second City and taking some um, um, taking um, some improv classes, teaching for improv classes, to help me get back in the swing of things of actually interacting with someone in a face to face environment because it had been that long since I had talked um, in a face to face setting. So when it comes to technology, though. Um, everything changes quickly, and there are a lot of new technologies. Uh, just imagine um, what a list would be like of all these, uh, excuse me, and what, the comp what exists now. Think about some of these things that are on this list. Don't even, they only lasted for about five or ten years, or they're in a different form, like MySpace. Um, Punya likes to joke that um, he remembers, as do I, when someone asks, what exactly is a Google? Now, can you imagine somebody actually asking that question today? What is Google? Um, you know, but a few years ago, not very long ago, the only thing, if you would have to look that up and determine, oh, that's a type of number, a very large number. So, when, um, it, it, it's, it's been quite a revelation. I had to take off a lot of the things that were on the slide the first time I saw this because some of these technologies we wouldn't even recognize because they died and, um, and they had such a short um, lifespan. So when we, uh, what does this mean for teaching and learning? It means that when we think about these three ideas, um, we have to think about how, how they constrain and afford one another. In this view, how we teach depends on what we are teaching and what technology we use. So when we think about it in this way, we are talking about a new type of understanding, something we call TPAC, or Technological Pedagogical Content Knowledge. So whether you're using a chalkboard or a uh, desk or a computer or the internet, teaching is always about TPAC. And so um, if you think about it in a little bit more detail, um, it's, thinking, it's taking in, in, into account the consideration that as a teacher, you have expert knowledge in your subject area. But uh, and, and you also, based on that subject area, you know certain misconceptions that your students might have about it. You know certain classic examples that people um, would have to know in order to master the content in that area. And you also know certain bodies of reading that are considered classic, as well as certain things that might be considered new, but a person that's trying to master that level, uh, that subject area would know. You know then how to teach in your subject area. For example, you would not teach mathematics the same way that you taught a writing course. You may have, you may have people, um, you, would, you may not have students read heavy essays in order to have them master algebra. It, it, or, but in like a higher, much higher level, like in um, non-Euclidean geometry or something like that, you may have some math, you may have a lot more reading based on you, but you know the strategies that are best for teaching your subject area. And based on those, based on those two things, with the technology, you now have the ability to ask the questions to determine which technologies best support how you teach in the content in which you're teaching. Um, Lucy, um, this is the basics of basic, basic part of, of TPAC, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Anybody have questions so far? They've seen, I think they've seen TPAC a little bit. So, so I think, so the, the we've, we've read, Articles about and that sort of thing, so they know have a they have a basic understanding of it. I think um, it would be great to hear 
you know, like practical examples, or I'd be curious about the research behind it, like how, you know, has what, what did Punya, Punya do to just, just, you know, like how did he determine this? I mean, how, from a re research perspective, that's just my question, like what okay. it based on? Well, again, he based it. Um, he based it off of a few ideas. Primarily, he and Matt Kaler. I don't want to leave um, Dr. Kaler out because the two of them developed this idea together. And it's primarily based off of. It's based off one of the ideas. I know that it's based off of. And I don't want to go into too much detail because um, I, I, I may. I don't. I want to tell you the things I do know. But I'm leave, I know I'm leaving a few a few parts of it out. <laughs> Um, but um, the, I, um, it's a book that was published by the National Academies of Press, um, maybe um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, but it's free to download through there, called Fluency in Information Technologies. And what it considers is um, it, um, what exactly does someone need to know in order to be considered um, technologically fluent? And um, I know that's one of the ideas to help um, inspire this idea. And also, again, with uh, Lee Shulman's work, um, thinking about the importance of a subject matter expert being able to not only know their subject matter, but also think about um, what are the pedagogical, um, ped pedagogical moves that have to take place. In order for that, um, in order for that subject matter to be delivered, um, and help students gain mastery of that subject area. Okay, sounds good. Um, I was uh, I was going to skip forward and show you um, a few examples that you uh, asked about of TPAC. Um, Let's see. You know, and basically what, before I go to that, when we're thinking about technology, one of the key things with TPAC is to recognize that very few, if anything, was developed, very few things, if any, were truly developed as an educational technology. Most things, the most technologies we use, even if we're not using them for educational purposes, we, um, we repurpose technologies for example email email for example can be used I use email today to send me a reminder I use it to send articles to myself as a so I'm using it as a storage device I use it to um, I use I use it to I use it to make grocery list and so when I'm shopping I've sent myself an email and I'll open it up in the store and now there's my grocery list but it's not that's not what none of those things are what email were necessarily intended to do they're basically meant to send messages back and forth to another person um so and and, and so thinking about and so as when you're using TPAC the goal is to think about not only how the tool is meant to be used but how might it be, how could it be used that would support your specific needs in your discipline? It, it does it in, in, we have a few examples here. Oh, it, well, these are more practical examples. Like, do, do you know what this is? Does anyone know what this is used for? Hmm. No idea. Um, this is an ordering system at a restaurant. Oh, really? Yes. And these are some other ways the technology has have been uh, repurposed. Like at, in the um, bottom left one, you see how they're using the ruler, not to measure anything, but to take a picture. And that vacuum cleaner is now being, a, you can now vacuum and read your book while you're vacuuming. Repurpose. Again, this technology that vacuum was not meant to um, pour it around an iPad, but thinking about how you can use technology most practically for what you're trying to do okay. to meet your needs. So why is this important? Only repurposing makes a technology and educational technology, as I've just mentioned. Um, like repurposing is a creative and innovative act. 
And so as you look around, think about ways that you can repurpose technology. And this is one example. So this is one uh, um, an example of how um, uh, Audacity was repurposed. In this article right here, um, you can go to to find out exactly how these students did it. But basically, the uh, moon, the, the landing on the moon is something that everyone is familiar with. And we've seen the audio and video clips of the landing of the moon, or if not, you have easy access to them through the internet nowadays. And so what these students did was they wanted to see if they could measure the distance from the moon using what they knew about sound. So they downloaded a sound clip and they measured the, di the distance and the echoes using audacity and this formula. And so now audacity has become part of a, become a, it has become a mathematic tool in this classroom to help students learn more about how to measure distance in the class. Another example is Tumblr, or you could use Instagram nowadays. Um, and in this example, students took pictures of what took place in the classroom and were able to do small pic pictorial blogs that explain how they experienced different parts of their science class that they um, would share with their parents and have and, and inspire conversations around in their classrooms. So a tool that was basically used for share, as a picture sharing site now becomes an educational technology. So when you think about it, these examples tell us that there are lots of ways these technologies can be used in our classrooms to help us repurpose them for, edu for, for the purposes of the content that we're trying to teach. It's, thinking of, it's learning to see, but learning to see things through a new lens. Um, <coughs> So here's my question oh. for you. So here's my question, Akisha. We gotta. I, I have to be really cognizant of time because everybody. Okay. Um, oh yeah, this is this is pretty much the end. Yes. Okay. Okay. So here's my question for you. What would you say to us? What's the implication for staff development? What do you think that we need to be? You know, what do what's the takeaway for us in terms of designing experiences for people to make sure that they they're leveraging technology in this way. Um, one to, to the, the most important thing is to not be afraid of the technology to be not the only way you can break this technology is if you actually pick up the physical device that is stored on and throw it away not be not take time to explore what all features that the technology has and think about how can these features be used in my classroom and is it and as you learn more about these technologies which ones are actually the best ones to use do you really need photoshop if there's another tool that does it better so when you're thinking that helps you think about economic efficiency when you think about the different efficiencies that you have to use in the class, that you have to be cognizant of, of when you're making purchases and or delivering experiences. Uh, what are, um, can one tool, what, what is the best tool to use for those devices? And which, which ones are the most practical tools to use? So, I, cause I, cause these, okay, so, so what I'm looking for specifically is tips for, for my students to think about when they're when they're designing a, a staff development experience or set of experiences for their for their schools so you know i so i'm just wondering how, what is what's the implication for tpac to that to actually designing an experience what would you say that they need to do uh a little bit more concretely um let's see um well, some well, um, I would say if they're going through different types of tech, if they're if they're taking time to explore technologies, for example, um, look at the tools that you already have access to and ask yourself, can these be tools be used for for um, 
can be can they be used for an experience as opposed to having to purchase something that you didn't already that that you don't already have? I don't think I'm answering your question the way that you. Uh, well, I, yeah, I, I, I so uh, that doesn't make sense to me because if they if they're doing training on something, they probably already have it. So I, I guess what you're trying to say is you want maybe they should be encouraging the teachers they're working with to think about the the various ways they can use what's at their disposal. Is that what? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, a better, that's a good way of saying it, to think about how they can use the different tools that are available to them at their expo disposal and to not be, a, and, and, to, and to think about how those tools apply to their different disciplines. Yeah, yeah, I think what's the tricky part is, is that for a lot of people who are experienced in the classroom, um, you know, for somebody like me, I go to, I go to see somebody do, a, a, you know, a, a session, a conference or whatever, and I can think of like 5 million ways I might use it. Um, there are a lot of other people out there who don't have, who have really limited imaginations or um, probably more likely less experience thinking about that sort of thing. And so I guess, I guess what I would say to my students in this context is that like, how can you build that background knowledge for your, for that you're working with so that they become more, they have more, they're more facility with, with um, using those tools creatively. Cause not everybody does. A lot of people get very stuck. They look at the tool and they think, Oh, PowerPoint, I'm just going to lecture instead of like maybe I'd use Google Slides instead and have the kids, you know, create a study guide with, with you know, a couple slides each in a collaborative deck. You know, like I, I think that, um, I think to have, helping, uh, helping teachers figure that out is really important. The other thing I'll add to this too, there were two people at the conference I was at who do a lot of work with lesson redesign. And I think that could be applicable here in terms of talking about the tools. So one is Scott McLeod, who's in Colorado, like Zach. Um, yes. And then the other person was Bern Jean Porter, who's been around for a gazillion years. And she wouldn't appreciate it if I said that. But she's she's been around since I started out doing all this. And she'll do a lot of, I've seen her do sessions where she puts up examples of work and then talks about how you would produce them and what's in a, and also it goes into rigor see what, what i think what this lacks for me from from what you're describing it is is the rigor piece like it doesn't it's accounting for different uses of tools but it's not accounting for the pedagogical piece it, like i don't see the rigor piece I, there's a p in there right but what i need to do is i need to explore this more so that i understand how how rigor fits into the pedagogical piece too Right. So the pedagogy is making sure that based on what you know about teaching your discipline. So it's assuming as a teacher that you know different strategies for teaching your discipline, that you have um, different levels of expertise of what of how you teach your your, um, your 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 discipline. So like, for example, I was a math teacher for many years and I knew different strategies for teaching in math. I, I knew different ways to, I knew five different or 10 different ways to show someone how to, how to, um, how to solve for X when you're teaching in math. And so when I'm thinking about technologies, as I'm examining different technologies, I'm using what I know about my content, about what math is, as well as how I teach math. I'm thinking about those at both times as I, as I go into um, developing my math lessons or repurposing my math lessons. Yeah, well, I think here's, so here's the problem, too, that we have spent more time on tools than pedagogy and a lot of um, teach, teacher professional development in general. And so I don't think, I don't think American yeah. teachers are as strong with pedagogy, which is actually, this is a really good transition, Akisha, to Zach, because I think Zach comes from a background of looking at the pedagogical perspective and inquiry using inquiry um, to drive that. So can, do you mind if we transition over? Because I want to make sure that we give everybody enough time and that, and that my students can get off to better grading papers or whatever they need to do. Is that okay with you? Can I switch? It's, it's fine, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Akisha. I really appreciate it. Stick around. And um, if you want to stick around, please stick around and contribute in the, in the chat. And, and maybe Zach will kind of piggyback off of some of the things that you said, too, because I think this might 
um, be an interesting conversation. So everyone, I want to introduce you to Zach, and hopefully he's there. I know he's there in spirit. If he, or he's he's here in the room somewhere. Hi, Zach. He's right here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, Zach has. Uh, I'll let him tell you his background, but he. The, the thing that I know him from is he was part of the Science Leadership Academy, the um, famed school in Philadelphia, and probably part of the original faculty, I'm guessing. And second this, year. Second close year? Close to okay. it. Okay, close to it. My same thing. And um, this is a, a school um, that may particularly interest the high school teachers in, um, in, this, in this cohort. And it has, they have a, a conference every year called uh, Educon that is a kind of an unconference. The kids run it. It's discussion based. It's it's talking about some of the deeper issues related to ed tech. And that's not about education. It's really not about ed tech. It's about education. And they now have a middle school and so on and so forth. But um, Zach has gone on to bigger and greater things. He worked for the Department of Ed. And are you back with St. Vrain now? I am, yeah. Oh, good. Okay, so tell us about what you're doing, because I bet it's exciting, because St. Brain is probably one of the more innovative districts out there. So thank you for joining us. Yeah. Love to have you, and take it away. Sure. Hi. Thanks, Lucy. Uh, thanks, Akisha, for that. Some, a lot to think about there. I, I have so many new tabs open in my browser. Um, I have to apologize. I have a new dog, and we've not done this before, and so <laughs> if, if I have to turn down and say, stop doing that. Know that there's a dog over there. We've had dogs visit uh, us before. It's okay. It's good. Okay, cool. Uh, so if I just start yelling, Otis, uh, that's why. Uh, so yeah, I'm back in St. Fran Valley School District in Longmont, Colorado, uh, where I'm the K-12 Language Arts Coordinator. Um, before I was at the department, I was in this district before as an instructional technology coordinator. Um, and my background, as you said, Lucy, is as a um, uh, an uh, English teacher in middle and high school mainly um, and I'm learning a ton about elementary school this these last couple of years as well so kind of all over the place on those pieces so yeah um, while I was at the department um, it's a very specific project and why I went to the Department of Ed I uh, was to work in the Office of Educational Technology uh, where I led the revision of the National Education Technology Plan. So a bunch of uh, what Akisha was talking about is, a, is stuff that filled two years of my of my work life trying to make that practical for people as well. Um, so yeah, that's the, the long and short of the bio there. Um, I don't have a former presentation uh, to come up with, but I do have a, a few links, Lucy. Do you think that would be helpful? Yeah, that's fine. This is either, I wasn't expecting a formal presentation at all. Like I, I'd rather chat and, you know, we can, we can do whatever you want to do. I'm here to ask questions and, um, or let you just t talk about Perfect. it on St. Frank, whatever you want to do. Um, I will add, I put a couple links in the chat um, to your book and to St. Vrain in general. Um, so St. Vrain, my background was St. Vrain, and not my background, but um, my knowledge of it is, A, I have a friend whose kids are in that district. Their dad owns a, a, a hardware store and um, in town and in Boulder, and they seem to really like it. And then Michelle Bourgeois, who's the tech director, is also an Apple Distinguished Educator and one, one of my favorite people on the planet. And, yeah, if you um, don't like Michelle, then there's something yeah, wrong with you. Yeah, and she's just, she's just really good. So I know good things are going there. You guys also got a Race to the Top grant. Um, and then I heard, I want to say I heard one of your assistant soups talk about your career in tech program or something somewhere that sounds awesome. So it keeps on crossing my path when, when we're talking about innovative schools. And then somebody named Becky from your district, and I have no Becky idea. Becky Peters. That. Yes, she's been she's been bugging me to be on her podcast. So so you guys keep coming back to me. And, and anyway, anyway, I it it sounds like exciting stuff is going on there. And I it's always I think for my students here, you need to start paying attention to like what the innovative districts are out there to see the things that you could that would be applicable to your situation. Um, I think that's one of the lessons learned from from these kinds of conversations. So anyway, that's my two cents. Yeah, um, those are good. I, I threw a couple of things in there. The first, I think, kind of maybe speaks to your question around TPAC. Um, so while I think that the research in TPAC and the kind of practical piece of it is super helpful, one of the things I struggle with on TPAC is that it does get deep into the kind of wonkiness of it. 
um, right? It's, it, folks feel like they have to get the details um, down too much or before they can get to the, the practical. Oh, I can't, I can't apply TPAC because it doesn't quite make sense uh, because I don't know all the research behind it. Um, so the piece, the first link that I shared there is actually the one that I turn to and I poke uh, teachers to look at and, and that's the um, uh, RoySimmons.com and the tool is PickCraft, which is an unfortunate name for a really useful tool. Um, because what it does is asks um, practitioners to look at some specific sets of questions about their thinking around the use of technology. Um, and, it, and it does two. And I hadn't found a, a schema that really helped with this. Um, the first one is um, the, on the vertical axis, it's asking what are the, how, how is this influencing the child's use of the technology? And on the horizontal axis, you're asking, I think I got those backwards. I don't have to talk about axes as much as I used to. Um, but you're asking about what the implications for the adult practice in the room are um, with the idea of how are we getting kids to create things using technology versus um, some of the more passive uses as well. Um, and then the two other pieces from a pedagogical place that I come from um, are David Hawkins' work around I, Thou, It, uh, which folks may know more if they're um, in the instructional rounds kind of background. Um, what Richard Elmore talks about is the instructional core. Um, and so that it talks about the relationship, if you think of it as a triangle, uh, and right, and so there's the thou of the student, and then each vertices is, is um, uh, there's the thou is the student, the I is the teacher, and the it is the, the thing to be learned or the learning experience. And so how are we thinking about those pieces as we're going through? Um, so those are the kind of some background wonky pieces, because you, know, you know, I like to deliver to a grad school lots more reading, right? Everybody loves it. Um, so that's the piece. Um, I will say that one of the things that's most interesting to me, uh, and I think probably why PickRat hits me as a useful tool is the research um, around the use of technology. And maybe some of you have heard uh, American Association of Pediatrics, right? They had their kind of two hours as the, as the limit um, for screen time for young kids. And then recently, last year, the year before, uh, they came out with new guidance that really kind of made things more difficult because they didn't say, oh, here's the specific uh, amount of time, but they said that what kids are doing on technology makes more of a difference as uh, compared to how much uh, time kids are spending in front of screens, which falls in line with a body of research that says um, active use of technology is more important um, than passive use of technology. So when kids are using uh, technology actively to do some of those great depth of knowledge verbs, creating, producing, making, um, they're much more likely to show uh, deeper learning uh, as they're going through more complex uh, tasks. And if they're passively interacting with the technology, then they are doing, um, they are shown, shown to be um, not only negligible uh, or, not, or neutral in their learning, uh, but they, it's actually been shown to decrease their ability around some of those tasks. Um, and then this will be sadly unsurprising probably to most folks, is that folks from historically disadvantaged backgrounds, kids from histor historically marginalized groups, are asked to do much more passive things with technology than their better resource peers. And I say better resource in much more of an economic uh, sense, um, because uh, oftentimes, uh, because of things like grants and donations, we see schools with a ton of technology, um, it, it, but they may have a more you know, impoverished um, student body. Do you think that's because there's this perception that certain basic skills are missing in those marginalized popul and populations, so, so, so that the, the, the tasks become more basic and less creative, and which could theoretically possibly engage kids more if they were deeper? and expected more of them, but there's always this kind of deficit thinking around it. Is that possible? Yeah. Well, I think we, we fall into this, and it, it comes from us being really caring uh, individuals, right? Uh, teachers are kind of inherently carers, and so we want to make sure kids are ready for the next thing before they go on to the next thing. Um, that's not really how we learn things, right? Um, uh, David Perkins talks about this in his book, Making Learning Whole, uh, where he says, you know, we... If we taught kids how to play baseball the same way we teach them 
how to do a bunch of the stuff they do in school. The first, we would say, once you learn how to pitch, we're going to teach you, we're going to move you on to learning how to catch. And once you learn how to do that, we're going to teach you how to learn how to bat. And then we're going to teach you how to learn how to field. And then we're going to teach you how to run the bases. And once you get all of those things done, then we're, we're going to try playing a game. Um, but that's not what we do. Think about uh, Little League. We, we throw kids, adorable, adorable children, out onto a field, and they start playing, with, playing the game, and then they come back to practice, and they're like, oh, there are some things I need to get better at. So we ask them to do as close to the whole thing as possible, and that necessitates those smaller skills. Um, so yeah, Lucy, I think it, it definitely goes back to, can you get these snippets down? If we get these building blocks, uh, which is a lot of my worry about kind of computerized, personalized learning, is that it atomizes the tasks, and, the, and so because of the limitations of computing, we're asking kids to do more simple pieces in pursuit of something complex, when really what we should be doing is saying, what's something really good and juicy and complex um, that we want kids to do in, instead of time? John Holt wrote this. He said, uh, if we taught kids, um, how to uh, speak the same way we teach them how to read, uh, they would never get to a full sentence. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, wow. Erica, you say, do you think it's the teachers? What do you mean by that? And now I've asked a question. So it was more going, going off uh, Lucy's question saying, do you think it's the lack of skills? But I was thinking about the role of the teacher. Yeah, I think it. I think it's. I think there's an there's an assumed lack of skill. Um, I think a lot of times we don't believe the kids can transfer knowledge from one place to another. Um, uh, I would oftentimes at SLA we were a, a project based inquiry driven school, and so a lot of times I would tell kids, "Here's what I would like you to do. Um, I'm not going to tell you the specific tool." You have to figure that out, and I would say, and it's open, and then, and you decide. But I can't teach you how to use all the tools, um, which was kind of goes against a lot of what we see, right? Like, oh, I need everybody to use, you know, uh, Google Slides or a PowerPoint presentation, and instead saying, you need to figure out. Here's your audience. Here's the task. You need to figure out the right tools to do the thing. And I think that would go in line with what Gary was saying last week. He's like, we waste time doing that. Teachers should be able. Yeah. To do this sort of thing and it's a it's a matter of expectations of of a, of humans not just the students but also of teachers you know if you if you assume that they're if you i think he was saying it in a much more severe way um if we all know gary uh you know if we if we coddle people then they're never gonna they're never going to rise to the occasion i guess is the way i would right well, and we treat emotional needs and learning needs as though they are exactly the same, uh, and that's not how the like, that's not how the brain functions, right? The 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 learning brain wants to get more complex uh, tasks. It want, it hungers for the novel, um, whereas is caring for um, people. They want some stability. So it's how do we kind of keep this interesting and keep this on firm and and not shaky ground. And if you can find the right uh, relationship, you're in a much better space. Awesome. So, how? Uh, so, what does staff development out of curiosity look like in St. Vrain? And are you leading it right now as part of your work? Some of it. Um, it depends. Uh, so, each school has has their own kind of staff development trajectory and calendar. Um, and I'll oftentimes get called in to ask to help with that. Um, one example, we've got an elementary school that said, you know, we have a lot of technology. They have had a lot of grants and stuff was donated. So we've got a lot more technology in as an elementary school than most of the other schools in our district. And just for context, St. Fran's about 411 square miles. We've got 32,000 students in about 50 different schools. Um, so it's a, yeah, it's a lot of space. And a lot of folks. Um, so they they said we have this, and so one of the pieces we used. Um, I'm gonna type it into the chat. Uh, one of the pieces I suggested is let's go through what's called the question formulation technique. And I don't know, Lucy, if you've had a chance to play around with that at all. Um, oh, this is like new to me. Oh, I love right question though. I've used that. I actually used it with a school I coached in fairly a couple of years ago. So this perfect. is a great resource. Yeah. 
So question formulation technique, you put a topic on the board and then the room generates as many and there's a bunch of different kind of modifications you can make. So for the teachers, um, we said in this faculty meeting, they put the question focus of um, the use of technology to support learning. And then the faculty came up with as many questions as they could around that topic. And you can imagine there were a ton. Um, and it was, it's, it's, it's about quantity, not quality. Then they went through and prioritized their questions and the school's leadership team sat down and said, how do we categorize these? Where do we see the through lines here? I think they came up with seven different categories. And so what they built then was um, a trajectory so that their faculty is engaged in project-based learning around their areas of uh, inquiry. Uh, so the same way that you would hope the kids in the school are doing, the adults are, are doing it. And the, and the principal of the school said, I can't give you all of our time uh, in professional development, but I can make sure, I will guarantee you this amount of time across a semester. And if there is more, I will add more as we go. And then at the end of the semester, each of these groups said, here's what we learned. So there were presentations of learning to the rest of the faculty, and they were all here based on faculty questions as they were going through. Oh, I love that. That's awesome. That's much yeah. more teacher-centered than it is, you know, you know, determining what needs to be done. So the needs assessment is, comes from the teachers. They say what they need to do, what they want to, yeah. what they want to pursue, what they, what's important to them. Ooh, and the principal, all, all the principal had to say was, here's the thing that I want us to figure out. Um, and so instead of saying, you know, Zach, can you pick a bunch of readings for us to do? Or can we, different people come in each month? Instead, it was the teachers driving those pieces. And we used Google Docs and a bunch of other tools where they could tag us in comments. So as a group was working through their inquiry, even if we weren't in the building as content specialists, they could tag us and we could jump into a Google Doc and, and give, provide the answers as they're going along. So here's another question for you too. I think this is really important. How are the content specialists working with the ed tech people? Like I, it, oh. it shouldn't be, you know, like I, I, it, it feels like it, your content pe people should be, have strong ed tech background too. It shouldn't be either or, right? So I'd be curious as uh, how Correct. you're working together. I'm going to show you, let's see if it, oh, it does. Oh, this worked out well. This is fun. I like pulling links. Um, so one of the things we're doing is the link that I just put in. Um, so we are in the second year of implementation of a bunch of new elementary literacy resources. And so we're a big school, a lot of, lot of schools. Um, and so we've created a television show uh, that we stream once a month, um, every fourth Tuesday, on a different topic of elementary literacy. And so that is a joint between, excuse me, the content specialists between the PD office and between the instructional technologists. So everybody's on that team saying, how do we make these things work? Um, so we're using our learning management system. We're using, learning to use YouTube streaming, um, the technical side of things. Uh, and then throughout episodes, we're building different segments like you would with an hour long like news show. Um, so there's some tape segments, there's one-on-one -on -one interviews, it's, it's all over the place, and that's everybody building it together. Um, and one of the pieces that we, we really are using to drive things, well, two. Um, St. Vrain has a learning technology plan, um, and when that got developed, um, we passed a mill levy that sustained our funding for technology, so at, at whatever it was currently when the mill levy was passed. And so then we said, how do we plan for the use of technology to support learning? And the first thing the district did was develop a list of actions and attributes. So what do we want the technology and our technology users in the district to do? As you can imagine, folks showed up with you know, brochures saying, we should buy these, we should buy these. And the district said, no, we wanna make sure that we figure out what we wanted to do and then we'll go look at what we're going to buy. Um, and so one of the kind of the two watchwords there are creativity and productivity. So asking uh, for that. But the other question or belief, I would say, is that um, technology decision, uh, these are curricular decisions, not technical decisions. And that's a real big belief across our district, but most importantly with our, our, our chief technology officer, right? So his question is always, how is this supporting learning? Um, not, you know, oh, can we handle that bandwidth? So when we need some stuff or we need to change how we do things, um, the conversation is, is this in service of learning? And then let's, let's figure out a way to make it happen.
that's the way it should be done. Um, hey, Laura, do you want to add your, you want to tell Zach your comment? Oh, so Laura, you, you were, I, so you were yeah, at, I, today. Okay. I was. Yeah, I just found, you know, I just found this, this whole, I went to a couple PD sessions and um, the last one was kind of interesting because it was very, it was a very, um, there weren't a lot of parameters that it's, I guess it's a small district. They have three schools there, but, um, but basically they decided that they were tired of it being, you know, this top down mentality of we're going to teach you what we think you need to know. And, and, and that's where your PD is going to come from. And so they basically turned it back to the teachers and they said, you know, we want you to pursue something that is relevant to you. And so um, they basically just, they had a check-in session every week. They had one administrator per school and, um, and all the teachers basically had to do, I guess they have an early, um, an early release day once a week or, or a late, late arrival. And they had 50% of their um, time given to them to just pursue whatever interested them. And they, had to show that it was gonna you know somehow um how it how it would impact either their students or their ability to be a more collaborative um staff member and um and then they presented some information on it and then at the end of this year they or or midway the teachers had to come back and kind of present what they what they pursued and there were some kinks in it and they're gonna you know um kind of try and work through some of that for next year but just the idea of um you know giving this you know voice and choice back to teachers just like we would want our students to have it it was it's it's it they treated it as such a new concept but in reality it's it's the way pd should be um so anyway so i found it really interesting well and one of the things so uh lucy was kind enough so chris lehman my friend and former principal and i wrote a book called building School school point 2.0 and one of the pieces we talk about there is the stuff that we want to we want for kids is what we should want for adults in our care and in our buildings as well so it, that lines up really well there one of the things that i find really interesting where i hear about these kind of passion projects or genius hours is that they're often in schools that are doing pretty well um, right so that freedom gets opened up if you can show that you can maintain some minimum testing expectations yeah. um, and so one of the pieces, and, and I think, uh, Laura, to your point, uh, um, is the kind of parameters, is one of the things we needed was to say, what, what are the goals? Like, how can we show that everything is working toward the shared goal that we've set out? Um, I think that there is, and this is where Gary and I would get into an argument, I think that there's a lot of value in that free kind of, ex, ex, um, kind of exploration of, of of passions as adults. But I think that there are also, when you're in a, a system of PD, there are problems that as an institution or an organization, we are trying to learn about and solve. And so I think that when we say, go figure out what you want to look at, um, and not say it has to be focused um, intently on, on helping us solve this issue, you miss some of the possibility there of getting folks kind of targeted, right? We don't like, if the CDC said, you know what, we're going to do genius hour. If you want to learn about knitting, um, and we probably wouldn't move forward around malaria uh, versus saying, hey, you can do it. Like we will fund some innovative and thoughtful research on, on malaria. You can figure out how you want to do it. But this is what we're going to, this is the problem we're all trying to solve on this, on this platform, which is not, Laura, what I think you were saying, but it is one of the pieces. I, well, a lot. I think, I think one of the things they wanted to look at for next year is, this first year, they, they, they really were trying to build up um, this level of trust with their te teachers that we are not going to be micromanaging you. We want you to, f we want to treat you as professionals. And, but they did say, you know, it's really hard to measure, you know, the, if, you know, individual PD is going to be valuable long term and for your kids. Um, and they wanted to look at, more tying the PD that teachers choose toward um, specific like SIP goals. Um, and so, you know, they said it was really early stages. There's a lot of things that we learned from it, but I just like the big idea of 
um, again, giving giving teachers choice and allowing them to, you know, have have say in in what direction do you want to go? What do you what do you want to learn more about? You know, to bring it back to your kids. Yeah. So, it, um, to me, it's like whether you see teachers as being capable or not capable. And I've worked in scenarios where, particularly inner city scenarios, where uh, people believe the teachers are uh, need to be fixed, and it's so insulting. And yeah, I think all teachers could benefit from some help doing something. They're not everybody is perfect at everything, but they they get caught up in in certain models that they think everybody should be doing. And if you're not doing that, then you're not an effective instructor. Like the idea of what is an effective teacher, uh, I, I think really varies. I think that's part of the problem. Um, and especially well, what's, what's I would the turn it around too. Yeah, yeah, how would you turn around? Well, I would say that there are also teachers who believe that about themselves, right? That is not just an external belief, that there are professionals that I've worked with who are like, I don't know, I don't know that I can do that, right? Or like, I need you to tell me that. So yeah. it's moving yeah. into the projects yeah. that I was describing or what Laura was talking about, there are teachers who are like, oh, I'm very uncomfortable. Just tell me what, they're what, not what I'm supposed to be doing. So they're not learners themselves. They, the curiosity and that sort of thing is missing. Or they're learning in one domain of their life and they're not learning learners in another, right? So it's not, yeah. I, I, I try to think of it as like, it's not that we turn like everybody is a learner or everybody's not a learner. It's that we don't see the transfer of like, oh, I can be curious when I'm thinking through, you know, what do I, I when I get curious about a recipe, but I can't be curious about the Im improving literacy um, versus, oh, no, I'm supposed to learn everywhere. So I think this, so there, I think there is a level of, go ahead. It seems to me like that the hiring process is really important with this. Like, I think, like, I, I don't necessarily, if I were a principal or a superintendent, I would be looking for people who are flexible thinkers, who are going to show some initiative and stick to it with it. Is or who, it who are ready to be that. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know how you, you know, how you screen for that. You know, I, how does Chris do it? How does Chris find his faculty? I mean, what is he looking for out of curiosity? Well, we, I mean, you, you find a... Uh, one of the pieces is when you get an interview at SLA, it's bring in a unit you'd like to teach. Um, so you're modeling that to see how that how how people approach those pieces. There's conversations about you know classes people would love to teach, that kind of thing. I think it's also just like what is what have you learned about recently, right? Like how do you approach learning? How what's something you've read recently? Um, I think that's one of the most important questions we can ask is is how do you learn? How do you learn best? I think that and the hiring process is an incredibly powerful conversation. Because if you ask a person, how do you learn best? And they are just stunned and they haven't thought about it at all. Well, that's worrisome to me is to, you know. I, th I think. I'm the, not going to make you responsible for other people's learning. Yeah, really. I think deep conversations are important. And I, I had maybe lost track of this a little bit. Um, until this last week when I was at the American School of Bombay and the teachers at that school are really good thinkers mm -hmm. and um, the conversations, you know, we, I was doing two workshops on global stuff and, um, and I asked some questions, I think, and this is also, I was also thinking about what Gary had said to us the week before about asking, having a good prompt before yeah. something and then letting them kind of loose. And so I asked, a question like, do you need to be, do you need to be a global citizen? Do you need to be a world traveler? And they really chewed on that for a while. Or, you yeah. know, probably, I, you know, for the sake of time is trying to get things going. I probably would not have spent as much time on it, but they were into it. They liked talking about that. So when, when some sort of conundrum came up, uh, another question I asked was, do you think international schools automatically, uh, you know, teach a global competence and you know or nurture global competence and that was another can of worms and so um and i just i just really appreciated how they how the their first their first inclination was to go in there and talk about it and and think out loud with their colleagues that really appealed to them and yeah. i think it's something that that school is probably nurtured because it's it's been strong in the inquiry they're, you know they're, they they used to do pyp and myp um they just have the IB program at the high school level now, but that's so rooted in what they do. And um, so if I were looking, if I were going back into a school district now, I think I'd be looking more for that. 
that kind of culture that's focused on that. I think, I think inquiry is like the most important thing you could teach if you're going to focus on anything with students and with teachers in general. Yeah. And where, where are you making room for it? Right. That's the other thing. So I was, a, I was working with one of our schools um, in a three hour PD block and then <laughs> sent out the email and the agenda and said, you know what, you only need to bring these two resources with you. And no one in the room brought those two resources with them. Um, so we're in their library and I needed to make a break. And so one of the things I said is I'm, I gave everybody a note card and I said, I want you to come back. I, like, you've got 10 minutes, go get these resources. But as you're doing it, the other piece that we're doing right now is looking for evidence of valuing process uh, in writing. Uh, I want to see if there's, where do you find it in this building? Um, and so what I didn't, I'd, we had no conversations of, you know, is process important? Is it important, important? Like, I didn't ask these yes or no questions. I didn't build a big argument. I just said, go see if it's there. Um, and then they came back and they had written a bunch of stuff on the note cards. And then I didn't say anything. Um, so I just said, so talk about what you saw and what do you think is important? And what do we, and then we got to have conversations about what they believe as a, as a building. And it was really fascinating stuff. Um, and it was just about getting out of the way. Uh, I think there, the conversation, or the question I've heard you ask Lucy is kind of in planning PD and thinking about PD. Um, if you are working harder as the facilitator than the other people in the room, then you're doing it absolutely wrong. Um, <laughs> if, if you are having to answer more questions, if you're having to do more work, if you're having to like solve arguments or fix people's um, uh, misalignment with, with institutional beliefs, then you are doing it wrong. Um, doing it right means making the space for them to do that heavy lifting and work and you to say, let me poke here uh, and let me ask this question as you're going through. Yeah, and being, being present in the PD um, in yeah. that regard. I, you, can't, you can't just say, here, go to it and then answer your email. <laughs> you know, you have to. You exactly. Have to, um, <laughs> much to my chagrin. I yeah. wish that was good practice because then I, I could get a lot one, done. Well, thing, that was the thing. That's one thing Gary was saying that he got a lot of stuff done during one workshop. And I, and in, and maybe in his, you know, it's, they're very hands on that sort of thing. People are doing their own thing. It's possible to do that. I can't, I have, I feel like I have, I, I feel like a need to be stuck in there somehow, at least, at least listening, like Eve's oh, yeah. walking around and eavesdropping. So well, I, think, I need to hear other people talk about ideas right it's it's I'm not there as the teacher I mean I am as the teacher but facilitator means I need that feedback right I need to know how to make this better for everybody am I meeting everybody's needs did the way I posed that question or made that poke uh, make I'm if, if it's not about like they may be doing more work than I am but we should be doing it just as much learning although about different things oh I think that's that's really well put and I think that's been this teaching this, this is the second time I've taught this course. And this time I'm bringing much more of a personal lens to it because I've been designing experiences along the way. I did some workshops at FETC. I did three or one two hour workshop and then, or two, two hour workshops and then a session and of varying degrees of quality. And I know in the one that I didn't like the most that I didn't pay attention to some of these things. And I felt like I had to be in control and always talking at them and, and, and they needed time to play. And so fortunately I learned those lessons between January and now. And so the workshops I did this week at ASB were pretty simple if you look at them on paper, but they, right. they were much more, the teachers really wanted the time to talk and interact and play with things. And I think we always feel like that's not, that's not PD. That's not good enough. That's not, but that's what teachers need these days. They need that because they, they have no time. I'm it's, it get it's, they're so pressed for everything. Um, what, how do you Can I add one more? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Akisha. I was just going to add, um, based on your question about hiring, I've worked primarily with teachers who are from lowly funded areas. Like I've worked in Gary, Indiana, um, parts of Washington, DC, things of that nature. And one thing I would say is to look for teachers who really know their communities. A lot of teachers who've had the most innovative projects and, and um, can lead the best professional developments are those who connect the classroom learning to what's going on in the community. For example, I had a teacher that worked in the Chicago public schools um, and um, 
I can't remember the name of the area right now. But um, what she did, it was a lot of abandoned lots in the area of her school. And she looked at starting a garden project and connected it with her biology class, excuse me, yeah, her biology class. Um, and But she also c used community um, outreach, like writing to the aldermen to get the plots of land so that they could use that in, the, in their classroom experiences. Um, so that's another thing. How well do they know their community and how and how and how do they think about connecting their community into um, their classroom experience? I think that's super, super, super important. And when I talk about the global work, Akisha, you know, in general and developing global competence, it's looking at global issues in a local lens is really important. So um, we were talking this week uh, about. And here in Northbrook, where I live, there's a big, gigantic landfill <laughs> that uh, has been around for eons, and they covered it with dirt and turned it into a golf course. But then they have these big methane outlets that look like you're, if you're driving from a couple miles away, you can see these kind of torches. Like they, they have to let the, the, the gas from all the stuff decomposing out. And so they're, they're these big tubes that literally have flames coming out of them in various parts of this landfill and like you look at this and like if you didn't know what it was it, you, you you'd be like what the heck i mean it just seems like such a bad thing right and i not not neither of my kids have ever taken a class where anybody's asked a question about this or investigated the local right. perspective of things so like I think that's, and that's also another opportunity for teachers too. Like you could, I'm just kind of riffing off your idea, Keisha, because I think it's really important. Um, you could design PD that's based on getting to know your community or getting to know the community or the teachers having to investigate the community in, a, in an academic context as learners. I mean, I'm, you know, I think, <laughs> I think that's really, really important. Yeah, just especially in areas where you don't have a lot of resources and you don't have a lot of funding, I, I suggest that to teachers because one, that's a way to get funding because it's addressing more than one question. Um, and it's, it's something that the parents also want to get involved in sometimes. And also other members of the community want to help support. At least that's what I've, I've seen. It's stewardship um, over your community too. Like in, 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 in Chicago, um, you know, there's so many, one of the examples of, you know, the empty lots, there's also a lot of abandoned housing. You can see it when you go to some of these really blighted neighborhoods, there's big red X's on the, on the houses and they're going to be torn down uh, or they're supposed to be torn down, whether they ever get torn down is another story. But like there's, a, I think there's a lack of appreciation for what is in your community. Like if you're living in the Pullman area, looking, you know, studying the Pullman town concept which is if you if you guys know i don't know if how much you guys know but there was a the pullman cars um i don't know how to explain this but the pullman factory or whatever in the south side of chicago and they were called pullman town and all the train people lived together so erica took her her kids on a field trip there that's the kind of stuff that you know for for adults and for kids to get out of your own context but if you live in these contexts too like appreciating what's around you i just think it's important it's the personal like it gives you some reason to understand and where your community is i don't know i i think you're spot on about this akisha yeah I, I would agree i put two pieces um two links in there one is uh david sobel's work about place-based education um it, this is an excerpt to his longer book about place-based um, learning and education. It's just fascinating. It's a tiny little book. Um, and then I also put in the link to Emerson University's Engagement Lab, um, which has done some really fascinating uh, work around um, uh, engaging, using, engaging uses of technology to help with community developments. Um, so one of their early projects used a simulation. So there was a neighborhood in Boston that wanted to um, redevelop and revitalize. And so they needed community uh, support and input. And so what they did is they created a virtual, um, uh, a virtual game uh, simulation. Thank you, I got it. Uh, a simulation where participants would join and they would take part in the community and experience the community based on somebody who was different than they were. So teenagers would participate as elderly folks and elderly folks would participate as teenagers and men and women across ethnic divides. And then they would have these conversations. So they leveraged the technology as a way to experience the environment um, and then they said, what did you get? 
what kind of empathy were you able to build there? So, cool. so those are two places that I like to look at. Oh, that looks awesome. I'm not saying that. I love this. This is great. And it's kind of using a design thinking kind of approach, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely building building that empathy before you move forward. Yeah, the other thing too, if, if you guys are interested in place-based education, um, you know, one of my favorite resources is uh, for for stories about this sort of thing. Everyone is getting the Getting Smart blog that um, uh, Tom Vanderark runs. He's a former superintendent and worked for the Microsoft uh, the Gates Foundation. And I think they do a lot with place based education and other kinds of themes like that too. So this is a really good blog. To oops, that's my bookmark. Sorry, that's I wanted to show you that too. Um, but anyway, yeah, getting smart, I think, is a really good resource. And then the other thing, too, that might be of interest to you, Zach, if you're interested in place-based, is um, my kids spend go to camp out in Wyoming. And I, I think I must have read about this in Getting Smart, but the Teton Science School in Jackson, they do a lot with place-based mm -hmm. education. They're trying to be really innovative. And we had their director of innovation keynote for our global ed conference a couple years ago. And they sounded like they were doing kind of interesting things, not super close to you, but not that far away either. But um, closer than Chicago. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Out West. But yeah, so I, all this stuff and like, uh, this is, this is great guys. I know that we're over our time, but this is such a great conversation that I didn't, I didn't want to stop in the middle of it. And I know that everybody's probably tired, especially if you guys went to the, um, ice conference today but the few that are left erica laura stephanie um do you guys want to do you have any specific questions for for akisha or for zach about this kind of thing um everybody's so quiet they're ready to stop I know, yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. We've I've heard I, enough from those people. Let I, us go to bed. Last year, I used to do it for two hours, and I've been nice to them, and we've been we've been sticking to about an hour. And uh, um, so I, I understand that everybody would be, especially if they've gone to the conference. Um, I'm going to pick on Laura one more time because I know she'll respond. Uh, Laura, anything else? How how what else did you learn at the ICE conference today? Out of curiosity, anything that came through? Um. Well, I. Honestly, it was a little bit more personally based for me because it was actually the first conference I've ever gone to. Yay. Um, yeah, nice. it, it really was. And um, yeah, 15 years of teaching and yeah. Well, it's, so it, it's easy in some places. Like I don't think when I was teaching Chicago public schools, I ever went, I went, I would go to like these PDs that were cost about $125 that were, that I would pay for myself that were in a hotel room somewhere. Well, and I, so it was kind of, it was more just, um, you know, because after being at home with my kids for the last couple of years, um, just kind of getting back with a, a lot of teachers. So there's that mentality of just being with a lot of teachers, but then you add the tech component and then it's just kind of mind blowing for me. Um, but I think I, I went to, uh, is his name? I think Adam Welcome. Or some, yes. something welcome. Kids matter or something. Yeah, kids deserve it or something. And um, so for me, it was just more of a kind of getting me sparked in getting back into teaching and kind of why I started in teaching in the first place. And um, so it was, it was kind of a neat experience for me. But, um, but you know, it's, it's a little bit sort of overwhelming <laughs> to you just, you hear all of these ideas and all of these people doing lots of different things. And um, yeah, so it was, it was an interesting experience for me, but a good experience and one that I would, that I would want, I would want to go back. Um, but yeah. Okay. Erica, are you going to ICE too? Uh, no, I'm not. But you had, <laughs> but you had Sam in your, you had Sam Chastain in your, in your school last week. And I bet you, I think Zach knows Sam. Do yeah. you? He does look at him. He was for my uh, in service on Friday. Yeah, okay. Sam and I are buds. Someday I hope to be as handsome as Sam. That's how. That's how. <laughs> I want. How did it go, Erica? Was it a good day? Yeah, it was really interesting. Actually, um, he did a presentation about just 
how technology has transformed education. And that was the first time I had ever heard of technological singularity. And it was really interesting and kind of mind blowing. But he also kind of led us in thinking about what we want to change about our school and how we can change it, which was also very interesting because our head of school was there and listened to everything we wanted to change so it felt a little tense but it was good I think you know that's I mean the fact that you're even broaching at an independent school change is like a big thing Erica when I was at lab we never talked about that because we were so good why would we ever change I mean it just never come came up in conversation I, I'm exaggerating but that was kind of like the underlying thing so nobody ever talked about innovation Nobody ever talked about what it looks like in other schools People very rarely went to the Isaacs conference or went to see other schools. So I actually think that Catherine Cook uh, has a little bit of an edge because you guys have had, it seems like you've had a little bit of an institution, institutional curiosity, um, more so than, than, than some of the other independent schools. So you're lucky. Yeah, we have people coming into our idea lab from other schools like every single day, just tours which is disruptive to my teaching, but I don't mind it. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's a compliment. That's a huge compliment. That's yeah. great. All right, um, I'm gonna let everybody collapse and um, go have dinner or whatever you need to do. And Zach, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Akisha, you too. If you guys ever need me to talk to your students or whatever, I'm happy to do that. Um, we'll call you in. Yeah, or I'm happy to do the same thing. Or if you guys are coming to Chicago for ISTE, let me know. And um, I'll extend the Chicago hospitality to you. Um, That's a deal. All right. So um, thanks, Laura and Erica, for hanging in there. And um, I think we got a lot of good resources out of this, and they're worth they are worth digging into and and considering applying in our final project. So um, thanks a lot, everyone. Have a good evening, and uh, we'll see you on the interwebs. Bye, everyone. <laughs>